change. Tonight's headlines, near Baghdad's gates, U.S. military closes in after big victories overnight. Iraqis heard discussing chemical weapons use during battle. Plus, saving Private Lynch, the dramatic rescue of a POW. Also tonight, we'll take you to Lynch's hometown to meet one very happy and relieved family. Celebrations in a Texas town after a judge throws out a string of drug convictions tinged by alleged racism and a new drug that may slow the progress of Alzheimer's disease. This is the CBS Evening News, with Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. As the war against Iraq heads into a third week tonight, there is major progress and a stunning battlefield victory to report. The U.S. military says two key Republican Guard divisions protecting Baghdad have been beaten so badly they are, quote, no longer credible forces. They were pummeled by U.S. forces now closing in on the capital from two sides. To the east, advancing U.S. Marines are now within 30 miles or less of the outskirts of Baghdad. To the west, lead elements of the Army's 3rd Infantry are within 20 miles or less. CBS has reporters with the Army and the Marines. We begin with CBS's Jim Axelrod. 2 o'clock this morning, Iraqi time. The 3rd Infantry began a two-stage push to get across the Euphrates River, hoping by day's end to be within miles of Baghdad. Covered by big booming cannons and rockets shot through the sky, the 1st Brigade led the way past Karbala, a battle dominated by artillery. It kind of like uh, clears the way for us. And if they hear it coming, they should run. If they don't, they're dead. The Americans sent a constant barrage, and almost nothing was coming back their way. The brigade took no casualties. What it did take was prisoners. We're a professional army, and we're able to bring all that power to bear at the tip of the spear. So when our soldiers go into close combat, I mean, he, his will to fight is broken. Maybe these Iraqis did have their wills broken, but the army was taking no chances. No, no. All along, commanders were expecting the second stage of this trip, the part after Karbala, to be the rough one. And they were right. As lead units approached the bridge, Iraqis began to fire. Mortars and AK-47s. Just about a half mile on the other side of that white smoke is the Euphrates River. This is a critical crossing point. Once they're on the other side of the river, the forward units of the 3rd Infantry Division will be less than 25 miles from Baghdad. This afternoon was not like this morning. For starters, the terrain, the familiar desert war, looked more like the jungles of Vietnam. And this time, Iraqi opposition was fierce. Finally, the Iraqis were beaten back enough for U.S. troops to start their trip over the river. It was 16 straight hours of movement and battle. These soldiers were exhausted, but exactly where they intended to be when they started their day, on Baghdad's doorstep. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, with the 3rd Infantry in Iraq. The battle appears to have gone just as well on the other prong of the push toward Baghdad, led by the Marines. CBS's John Roberts reports the vanguard of their advance is now on the far side of the Tigris River, roughly 75 miles east of the Army's frontline troops. For the first time in a week, the word cakewalk is resurfaced in the Marines' vocabulary. Went pretty well today. We were expecting some heavy resistance in this town, but it didn't seem to materialize. Uh, seems like the enemy were pretty overwhelmed as we came in, and uh, seems like they're starting to pull out. After fighting an unexpected street-by-street -street guerrilla war in the southern city of Nazaria, Marines now have the upper hand of overwhelming force against a weakened enemy. They stormed across a strategic bridge spanning the Tigris River this morning, while the Baghdad Division of the Republican Guard stayed bottled up under heavy American bombing just a few miles away in El Kut. By mid-morning, the Marines owned the main road to Baghdad. With the Marines now firmly in control of Highway 6 and the Baghdad Division cut off, the only thing that stands between them and the capital city is the Al Nida Division of the Republican Guard. But it's a safe bet that before the Marines get anywhere close to that division, it will be subjected to withering bombardment from American aircraft. For all the talk of fierce resistance against an army of invaders, things have gone pretty well for these Marines. But they are still cautious, 
the Iraqis may have some fight left. And there are broad fears that Saddam could unleash chemical weapons if he senses he's going down. I'm expecting worst case. We're, we're going to prepare for the worst case. It's up to the it's up to the enemy what they choose to do, and we'll respond accordingly. And as the Marines found in Nazaria, the real battle may begin when they reach Baghdad's gates. John Roberts, CBS News, with the Marines near Al Kut. Whatever may lie ahead, this was certainly one of, if not the, most successful days of the war so far for U.S. forces. We take you now to CBS's David Martin at the Defense Department for tonight's Big Picture, the overview. David? Dan, with American troops now on the outskirts of Baghdad, U.S. forces are making plans to capture key installations just 10 miles from the city center. The American attack caught the Republican guards before they could execute an order to pull back their formations into fighting positions closer to Baghdad. When the lead brigade of the 3rd Infantry Division streamed through the Karbala Gap and across the Euphrates River, the opening phase of the battle for Baghdad had turned into a rout. But there was little sign of Iraqi dead and only handfuls of prisoners, suggesting the soldiers, probably by the thousands, had abandoned their equipment and fled. Whether to melt away or fight another day remains to be seen. If they regroup in the villages and towns that lie scattered across the road to Baghdad, the fighting could become like the alley-by-alley -alley battles in the southern cities where American troops have suffered most of their casualties. We are expecting or at least planning for a very difficult fight ahead. We are not expecting to drive into Baghdad suddenly. Difficult doesn't begin to describe the Iraqi plight. State TV showed its soldiers fighting back, but they are hopelessly outgunned. The head of the Republican Guard vowed to teach the enemy a lesson, and he still has parts of four other divisions arrayed around Baghdad. But he is powerless to stop the hail of bombs, which continues to light up the horizon. As for chemical weapons, none were fired today, but the Iraqis can be overheard on their radios talking among themselves about using them. Dan? David Martin reporting live from the Pentagon. Whether he is alive or not, Saddam Hussein's Iraqi regime has ignited oil fires in Baghdad, hoping that the smoke will keep Allied pilots from seeing their targets. The black plumes of more than 20 fires are visible in this photograph taken yesterday by a commercial imaging satellite from 400 miles up in space. The smoke has had little, if any, impact on the accuracy of the bombardment. However, it may be that not every strike is precise. Iraqi witnesses say a U.S. missile hit a Baghdad hospital today. There is no independent confirmation of this. Iraqi officials claim several people were killed and more than two dozen injured. Also today, the Arab satellite news channel Al Jazeera reported that the Iraqi government has withdrawn the press credentials of some of Al Jazeera's reporters. The reason for this, unknown. In southern Iraq, the battle for Basra goes on. CBS's Mark Phillips reports the mostly British forces assigned to capture Iraq's second largest city and biggest port are taking it slow and steady to protect civilian lives. The siege of Basra may contain lessons on what Baghdad holds in store. British artillery has been trying to flush out the hardcore resistance around the city. Stop clear! firing flares to illuminate targets as well as shells to destroy them and trying to do that without killing civilians. We've not caused any civilian casualties so far. But an intelligence alert shows the threat works both ways. News Justin reports that the Iraqi Air Force is prepared for chemical bombardment in northern Basra. The chemical attack doesn't come. At daybreak, foot soldiers search house to house more prisoners are taken, more weapons are found, and more evidence is discovered of the regime's brutality. This, residents say, was a torture cell of Saddam's Mukhabarat secret police. The fate of the people who own these ID cards, unknown. Yet there are still many more regime loyalists holding out. Many. But how much, how, how many, I don't know clearly. The fear of civilian casualties has kept the coalition from launching an all-out assault on Basra, but that standoff has now spawned a new kind of mistrust. A fear among local residents that the Allies, who have been here once before and then withdrawn after the first Gulf War, are no more committed this time. 
a fear that Saddam will be back to exact his own bloody revenge once again. Mark Phillips, CBS News, Kuwait. U.S. Army Private First Class Jessica Lynch, the young soldier rescued by commandos from Iraqi captivity last night, is now at a U.S. military hospital in Germany. She arrived there tonight aboard an Air Force transport jet. She's reported to have suffered both gunshot wounds and broken bones during her ordeal. Lynch was missing in action for nine days after her unit was hit by an Iraqi ambush near the city of Nazaria. CBS's Lee Cowan has the story of the daring mission that was dedicated to saving Private Lynch. The objective may have been a slim 19-year-old Army supply clerk, but the mission to retrieve her mobilized the entire Pentagon. Virtually every asset on the battlefield was used, from a battalion of Marines who drew fire as a decoy to U.S. Special Forces who ran through a hail of gunfire not once but twice. There were firefights outside of the building getting in and getting out. It was an Iraqi hospital turned paramilitary post that had been Lynch's uncomfortable home for 10 long days. We've just arrived here at Saddam Hospital. Which Military was... officials showed WFOR reporter Mike Kirsch the room where Lynch was held. It was here she lay suffering from two broken legs, a broken arm, and multiple gunshot wounds, being treated not by a doctor, but by an Iraqi pharmacist. She's uh, very good, healthy, and I every day see Jessica. She's crying about her home. He wants to go home. Battered and broken, she finally got her wish. Saved by strangers, she now considers family. Still, not a single member of the secret special operations community is willing to take credit for the daring rescue saying only that every branch of the service was involved, from Navy SEALs to Army Rangers. It was a mission one described as a midnight ballet, with just one tragic turn. It came on a tour of the hospital grounds, where the team was led to 11 bodies. Bodies some fear may well be the other members of Lynch's unit, taken captive on the same day. And some brave souls put their lives on the line to make this happen. Loyal to a creed that they know. That they'll never leave a fallen comrade. One is now on her way home, but there is still a lot more work to do. Lee Cowan, CBS News, with U.S. Special Forces in Kuwait. Coming up next year on the CBS Evening News, Eye on America goes back to Jessica Lynch's hometown, now filled with joy and gratitude. The number of Americans confirmed killed in action in Iraq now stands at 54, also killed 27 British. There are seven known U.S. prisoners of war held by the Iraqis. Fifteen other Americans are listed as missing in action. Off the list, of course, and now safely back on friendly turf in Germany, is Army PFC Jessica Lynch. For tonight's Eye on America, CBS's Jane Clayson went back to Lynch's hometown, where one phone call turned gloom into glee. Just after supper last night, Greg and Dee Lynch got the call. At first, I thought it was an April Fool joke. They uh, said, uh, we rescued your, your daughter, Jessica Lynch. After nine difficult days, they finally knew for sure their daughter, Jessie, was alive. I was up and down, you know, just like every day. But yesterday, it was just, um, I just knew yesterday was going to be the day. I just knew it. At news of Jesse's dramatic rescue, family and close friends rushed to the Lynch home to celebrate. We were just so overwhelmed and happy and just hugging everyone and talking to everyone. I don't, I don't know, you can't even describe it. While Jesse's family is filled with joy at the news of her rescue, they won't rest easy until they get that one important phone call from Jesse, telling them she's okay. We haven't got to talk to her yet and uh, or any word of her condition. I have no idea uh, why we haven't heard anything yet. We hope it's very soon. And they were saddened to realize that their daughter was injured and that she'd been a POW and not just missing. We didn't know she was a captive even, and uh, that really hit hard. It was especially tough for the Lynch family and Jesse's good friends to see this photo of Jesse's rescue. She looked a little scared. At least we know that she's safe. She's not with the enemy anymore. We all stuck together and we prayed and we got our miracle. I was, was lost. 
And everywhere in this tight-knit community today, there was an outpouring of relief and thanks. Well, as soon as she's capable, we're planning one heck of a big shindig. In Palestine, West Virginia, I'm Jane Clayson for Eye in America. On the CBS Market Watch, some newfound optimism about the progress of the war since stock prices soaring today. The Dow up 215 points, the Nasdaq 48. Still ahead here on the CBS Evening News, righting wrongs in a Texas town. Dozens of African Americans may have been busted for drugs, not based on evidence, but based on race. When these men they're out on the front lines defending their country, but you won't believe what's happening while the troops are fighting the war in Iraq. It's very frustrating. It's emotionally frustrating. Why soldiers overseas are targets for high-tech crime at home. One of the big problems is you don't know when the imposters are going to use the information. The story tomorrow on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. It is a painful episode in a Texas panhandle community of 5,000. Four years after the fact, justice, as they argue it, may finally come to dozens of African Americans busted for drugs, convicted, and in many cases serving time based solely on one man's word. It happened in Tulia, Texas. CBS's Bob McNamara is there. A four-year West Texas nightmare could soon be over. I want to tell it to you like this. Hoorah! The nightmare was undercover cop Tom Coleman's making. Is one man allegedly racially motivated drug sting operation that rounded up 46 people in Tulia, 39 of them black. Cases a Texas judge now wants thrown out and those jailed released. <laughs> For families of over a dozen people doing long prison terms, there's finally a sense of justice. Maddie White had three children sent to prison by Tom Coleman. This man, he just, he was just a bad man. He's just really a bad person. This is a lesson for how the war on drugs does not work in this country. Though it took little more than Tom Coleman's word to send so many people to prison, Coleman's vocabulary was well known to be full of racial slurs. Though he denied he's a racist, Coleman's ex-wife swore in an affidavit that he'd been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Sheriff Larry Stewart hired Coleman to rid the county of drugs and has stood behind his work. My instructions to Mr. Coleman when he came to town was to take his investigation uh, wherever it led him. But Billy Wafer was one of several arrested and released when it was suspected they'd been framed. I ain't an angel, but I've never, ever sold drugs. Vincent McCrary did three years behind bars before he was let go. I miss a whole lot of my kids and my family life, and that's, that's something you can't replace. Prosecutors say they won't retry the cases, and it could take months before the courts decide how to deal with the Tulia convictions. But until then, supporters of those wrongly convicted will embrace this victory, holding to the hopes that have brought them this far. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Tulia, Texas. And just ahead on the CBS Evening News, a big boost for Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers. The first effective drug for later stages of the disease. Tomorrow morning, we'll have complete coverage from the front lines in Iraq, and we'll be sending messages from the fighting forces to their loved ones back home on The Early Show. We end tonight with news of science and medicine. Researchers are reporting the first Alzheimer's treatment that appears to slow progress of the disease in its later stages. CBS's Elizabeth Callerton reports why this means so much to patients and the people who care for them. It's the most dreaded stage of Alzheimer's disease. Up we go! When adults become children, unable to dress themselves, clean themselves, or feed themselves. They often have to be institutionalized, and a common plea of caregivers is... If only we can do something to slow this down. Now, for the first time, we'll be able to do that. Dr. Barry Reesberg and colleagues have just completed studies of a drug called memantine and find that in advanced Alzheimer's patients, it really makes a difference. This is a breath of fresh air for patients who are very distressed in this in this stage. 181 patients were followed for six months. Those given memantine showed half as much mental and behavioral decline as patients on a placebo.
Other Alzheimer's drugs on the market, like Aricept, are only effective in mild and moderate stages of the disease. The news about Memantine has given a glimmer of hope to Don Costa and his wife, Connie, married for 50 years. Oh, you're looking for hopes. That's all you got. Diagnosed three years ago, Connie already needs a lot of care, and she's at the early stages. Don knows what lies ahead and is relieved to know Memantine might help. She took care of me all my life, you know. I take care of her. No. Memantine is being reviewed by the FDA and could be on the market in a few months to a year. It's a rare advance against a disease medicine has had trouble slowing down. Elizabeth Caledon, CBS News, New York. And that's part of our world. I'll be back later here on CBS with 60 Minutes 2. They are American troops trying to win the trust of Iraqi villagers. Hello. How are they doing? Scott Pelley is with them. Plus, this car is what GM considers the future, a fundamental change because it doesn't use gasoline. We invite you to join us for 60 Minutes 2, tonight at 9, 8 Central, and at the usual time tomorrow for the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. See you soon on 62. For news 24 hours a day, log on to cbsnews.com. Are soldiers overseas targets for high-tech crime at home? Tomorrow, experience CBS News.